Yi, his legendary career is all the more impressive given the excesses of his personal life. He was a heroin addict until he was 27, later a violent alcoholic. Furiously self-destructive, Stan Getz wasn't expected to outlive the 1950s, yet he continued to create beautiful music for 40 more years. His attempts to reach perfection were at the expense of everything else. I practiced the saxophone eight hours a day for two years. After that, I never practiced again, Getz said during an interview. The life of Stan Getz was a roller coaster ride. The tenor saxophonist, whose distinctively beautiful tone earned him the nickname The Sound, entranced listeners and put him on top of the jazz poles. Yet, his personal life was turbulent, marred by depression, alcohol, heroin addictions, and violent outbursts. Stanley Gajewski was born on February 2nd, 1927, and raised in the Bronx. Getz was a handsome, intelligent child who was drawn to music. Getz's father, Alexander, was a Ukrainian Jewish immigrant who was born in London, while his mother, Goldie, was born in Philadelphia. Getz's original family name, Gajewski, was changed to Getz upon arrival in America. He began playing harmonica and demonstrated perfect pitch and a photographic memory. He acquired a beat-up alto saxophone in 1940, played local gigs, and saved enough to buy a tenor saxophone. He moved on quickly to play other instruments, but fell in love with the sound of the tenor saxophone and began practicing eight hours a day. According to Getz, he only had about six months of lessons and never studied music theory or harmony. In 1943, he quit school and joined the band of trombonist Jack Teagarden and was offered $70 a week. He returned home to the Bronx tenement, expecting an argument about going on the road, but his dad surprised him. Go, his father told him emphatically. 70 bucks a week. I can't make that in two weeks. And I haven't had a job in a month anyway. By nature, Getz possessed an extremely addictive personality. At 15, he took up smoking cigarettes at the rate of a pack a day. He also discovered that alcohol helped lower his anxiety, so each night, he was getting drunk. Stan's days with the Tea Garden Band ended in 1944, when he was 17. The band was in California, and Stan wanted to stay there. In 1944, he joined the Stan Kenton Band and, at 18, became its premier soloist. Kenton worked with Bob Hope on his popular radio show, which reached 20 million listeners each Tuesday night. The Kenton Band followed Hope around California, playing at wartime troop bases. There were several musicians in the Kenton Band addicted to heroin. Taking note of how much Getz drank each night, one of them turned him on to heroin, snorting it in the back of the band bus. Within a few weeks, Stan was addicted. Working in Kenton's band, Getz carefully studied the work of his idol, Lester Young. He learned his solos note for note and began incorporating them into his solos. It was over a disagreement about Young's relevance that Getz left Kenton in April of 1945. In October of 1945, Stan regularly went into New York and hung out at the Spotlight Club on 52nd Street to hear Charlie Parker perform. During these visits, he met Beverly Byrne, a vocalist with Gene Krupa's band. They dated and married in November 1946. After leaving Kenton's band, he joined Jimmy Dorsey and then Benny Goodman, who fired him for missing performances while he was scuffling for heroin. With Woody Herman's band, he made a name for himself with the recording of Four Brothers and Early Autumn. With Early Autumn, the more airplay it got, the bigger the Getz name became. Stan was now officially a star, based on one solo, and everybody wanted to hear him play. Beverly and Stan suddenly had enough money to buy a modest house in New York, and by December 1950, 
Stan Getz was recognized enough to be asked to open at Birdland with Charlie Parker and Lester Young. He is 22. Getz left Woody Herman's band in 1950. He was 22 years old, addicted to alcohol and heroin, married and a father. Still, he toured internationally, recorded prolifically as a leader, and maintained his popularity in the jazz polls. In March 1952, Stan recorded Moonlight in Vermont, and his audience grew. He was making $1,000 a week and spending almost all of it on heroin. His wife Beverly was also addicted, and they made frequent six-hour round trips between Long Island and Philadelphia to score cheap junk. He was keeping his career going in spite of his habit. Stan signed with Norman Grant's records label in 1952. Grant's put him on tour with a jazz at the Philharmonic Company, and things were great until he got busted in a Los Angeles narcotics sweep. He had been on heroin for nine years and wanted to get off of it before he went to prison. While on the tour, he took barbiturates and drank alcohol liberally to lessen the inevitable withdrawal symptoms. He was strung out during the entire tour and tried to pick fights with other musicians on the bus. Locked in his room, desperate and ashamed, Stan tried to kill himself by swallowing a fistful of barbiturates. He was rushed to the hospital where doctors were able to save his life. In 1953, he was arrested again on a narcotics charge and spent a few months in jail. But he continued to maintain an impressive musical career. Within 36 hours of his release, he was performing on stage with Chet Baker in Los Angeles. Only three days later, he was playing an all-star concert before another California crowd of 6,000 and received a thunderous ovation when he arrived on stage. Norman Granz put him on tour with the band of Duke Ellington. In December of 1955, he was the featured guest soloist with the Count Basie Band. To round out the year, he won the downbeat pole for the fifth straight time. While playing a Washington DC club date, he met a 19-year-old Swedish aristocrat named Monica Silverskold backstage. She was attending the gig with friends. Stan flew unannounced to Sweden in the autumn to be with her. Once again, he went through heroin withdrawal, this time ending up in a straight jacket in the hospital. He came down with pneumonia and nearly died. Monica felt that God had given her a perfect life and had sent Stan so that she could help him. She made it her mission in life to take care of him. Her wealthy family sent them off to Africa so that he could recuperate without drugs interfering. They returned to Sweden, where they were engaged to be married, and Monica gave birth to their first child. Stan went on tour and got a Mexican divorce from Beverly. In 1958, he moved to Copenhagen, returning to the US in 1961 to find that jazz music had changed and John Coltrane was more popular than him. He recorded a critically acclaimed album, Focus, and was introduced to Brazilian music by Charlie Bird, with whom he recorded Jazz Samba. The album rose to number one on the charts, and in 1963, earned Getz a Grammy for Best Jazz Solo. In March 1963, Stan went into the studio to record Getz Gilberto. The only Brazilian fluent in English at the session was Gilberto's wife, Astrud. Stan asked her to sing The Girl from Impanema. She had no training or experience, but Stan liked her voice. The album won Album of the Year in 1965 and the Best Jazz Instrumental Award for Getz. In 1966, Stan and Monica bought an estate in Irvington, New York, named Shadowbrook. The 36-room, 10-acre estate overlooked the Hudson River. Getz had also become a favorite performer at the Johnson White House. He was asked to travel to Bangkok, Thailand, to play for the King and Queen during Lyndon Johnson's state visit to that nation. It turns out, the King was a big fan of Getz. During the 70s and early 80s, Getz's touring alternated with rehab, 
and another European stay, yet he continued to produce impressive recordings. Stan recorded his first Columbia album, The Best of Both Worlds, in May of 1975. On November 20th, 1976, Stan was back at Carnegie Hall for Woody Herman's 40th anniversary concert as a band leader. At the end of January 1977, he recorded Stan Gets Gold in Copenhagen and then celebrated his 50th birthday. While Stan was living in Europe, another musical revolution had occurred in the US. The rise of modal jazz, as played by Miles Davis and John Coltrane. It didn't elude him that while he was helping Swedish musicians play swing and bebop, the Americans were building a new musical venture and selling records. John Coltrane's My Favorite Things became a hit, and after 11 years, Getz lost both the metronome and downbeat poles to Coltrane. Stan returned to New York, but his audience had dwindled. As his dates were canceled, he realized how easily the public can forget in only a few years. Finally, in 1985, he attained sobriety. Stan left for a tour of India and Australia, where he was an undisputed star in the press. When he returned, he recorded The Dolphin in San Francisco. He liked the city and decided to move there. He also decided to divorce Monica. Stanford University took an interest in Stan as a possible artist in residence in the music department. He soon realized that he could leave the road and stay and teach if he played his cards right. He became the artist in residence on January 1st, 1986. His schedule required him to teach six hours a week. He once said, I never thought of it as an art. It was just work that I loved. Not just work, but work that I loved. I loved it so much I would play it if nobody listened to it. On July 1st, 1988, Stan performed at a memorial concert for Buddy Rich at Carnegie Hall. After returning west, he was informed that he had liver cancer. Stan flew to Copenhagen in February of the following year. Although he was ill, he recorded People Time. Then he went on to Paris to perform, but by now Stan's playing was showing the strain of his sickness. In March 1991, he returned to Malibu and then left for a vacation in Hawaii. On his return from the trip, his health deteriorated rapidly, and he became homebound. On the morning of June 6, 1991, Stan asked to be helped to the window next to his bed so that he could gaze out at the ocean. He passed away at 5 p.m. that night. He was 64. On June 9th, Stan's ashes were poured out of his saxophone case, six miles off the coast of Malibu Beach by his grandson, Chris.